Well, I am here with Afua Otto with the Perception Institute, who is a new partner in our industry, at least through by way of the National Association of Realtors. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Thank you for having us or having yeah. me. Yeah, you bet. It's an us. You represent all of your all of your folks back at the Institute. Absolutely. Tell me, why don't we start there? Why don't we start with the new partnership that you and NAR have established? The kind of first tactical exhibit of that partnership was a 50-minute video released recently about implicit bias in our industry specifically, um, which was awesome, awesome resource. We'll link up to it in the show notes. We sent it out to our membership for sure. But what else should we expect from the partnership that you guys have established? So we came on board with a National Association of Realtors uh, earlier this year and in a proactive stance through NAR to really address the ways in which bias impacts uh, the breakdown of relationship and impedes uh, access for many underrepresented folk to home ownership and housing and, and, and livelihood stability. Um, and the, the new president, Brian Green, was uh, along with his team and staff and committee, were just more enthusiastic about bringing the, na the nation of, of realtors on board and real estate agents on board um, to tackle this really crucial issue. And then uh, the pandemic hit. And so we found ourselves um, troubleshooting in response to some of the, the intensified dynamics around trauma and coping relative to um, implicit bias and, and really harm against one another across lines of difference. So uh, again, NAR was really proactive in working to establish fair housing equity um, in time and, and almost ahead of Fair Housing Awareness Month in April. Mm -hmm. uh, but when, once the pandemic hit and slowed things down, then came the, the PSA and the 50 minute video that you all have an, access, uh, an opportunity to access. Yeah, so that, that's good to know though, that the relationship between NAR and the Perception Institute really had, had been established well before the conversation that we're having at a national level at this point. Oh, absolutely. Um, was the timing of the video though in, in coincidence to the George Floyd incident or, or not? That was the universe bringing, bringing things together. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that so happens, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, as we see, right? Because we all were home or we all were shut in or shut in quarantine as we watched Minnesota unfurl, right? And so right. Uh, we were in the process of filming the, a training video and training module, the, the longer version um, uh, from the comforts of, of my staff and mine's home <laughs> doing the, the yeah. best DIY version that we could to, to get out to you all in time for Fair Housing Awareness. And so the uh, incident in Minnesota erupted. We actually hit pause and worked with our team to create the most comprehensive, diverse, um, and thoughtful and in intentional PSA around equity that we could, um, we could, we could create. And so that's the P the shorter version that you see. And then uh, came the, and then we went right back um, into the weeds using the, the, the momentum of the moment to help craft out um, how to best translate what we uh, refer to as the mind science of bias into proper curriculum for, for NAR. Yeah, it is so, I mean, that is the name of the game in 2020 is that our environment is shaping our strategy each and every day. <laughs> you know, another spot on the bingo card is filled and then we're trying to figure out how to respond. Um, you guys did a beautiful job of it with the initial video launch. So how much more curriculum can we expect for, as a result of this partnership? What more is to come? So there's, uh, in addition to the video, we take the video and, and kind of pull that apart and intersperse our virtual training and le adult okay. learning uh, modules so that there's, a more interactive activity, um, facilitated discussion, and group work, right? That we can all break out into virtual chat rooms. That seems to be like the fun thing in, in yeah. being more now. That's right? all we got. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, in, and then infusing aspects of the video throughout the, the training and really kind of pulling on participants' experiences as well to help drive that training. In addition to that, um, it, down the line, NAR will also be incorporating some train the trainers. So individuals from among the, the national uh, experts 
in, in real estate will have an opportunity to step forward and acquire additional knowledge so that it can be shared throughout the organization as well. That's awesome. Um, I think, you know, I think both you and I would probably agree that the impact our industry has on um, our ability to change the name of the game in, in this rhetoric is so powerful. Um, housing is a wealth building activity. It's an anchor culturally. It's so important in, you know, prescribing who you might be when you when you evolve from from your childhood home even. And so I think doing this work with our industry is really, really important. I want to try to break it down a little bit so that we simplify some of what we're talking about. So how do you describe what an implicit bias is versus an explicit bias? So explicit is what we saw on television, right? That yeah. was uh, the assassin, the murder of George Floyd, and subsequent, right, um, state-sanctioned, you know, responses to people of color, men of color, yeah. um, women of color, trans folk of color, um, and and those overt symbols or, or or expressions of racism, of sexism, um, oftentimes aren't caught on camera, and when they are, oftentimes are contextualized so that they make sense to the viewer. The implicit bias, though, is oftentimes, it simply is considered a, a subconscious or an, uh, the brain's unconscious association with stereotype around a group um, or a person. It is also just the brain's um, bias against or aversion to or preference for a certain person, right, based mm -hmm. on um, ideas, schema, and, and stereotype, as well as attitude. And that's it. We have biases towards individuals. We have biases toward products. Um, capitalism in America is kind of built on, uh, you know, gauging one's, you know, bias and or preference for mm -hmm. one di dynamic over the other. Um, however, interpersonally, uh, these our interactions as human beings are really important, right? And have and we know because we're bonding via Zoom. But uh, this, is a, this is a moment between the two of us. We are relational beings. And so the interpersonal experience is so important. And if we're not aware of the biases we have around or toward or, or to people, it will impact not only the relationship moving forward, but it may have lasting impact on the person who has experienced the harm or the transgression um, or the offense. Yeah, and I think that kind of speaks to where we have been versus where we're going. Uh, <clears throat> implicit bias could be considered passive, but that doesn't mean that you get a pass, right? Like you, it's still there and it's still done harm for a long, long time. In fact, in some ways it's probably done more harm in the sense that it's so unrecognizable because it's become such a part of who we are as an economy, as a community. And so I think it is really, it can be hard to detect and understand, which means you have to take deliberate action to do so. And I'm glad you mentioned that because the ambiguity of implicit bias actually ha is what uh, exacerbates its, mm. its presence in our lives. And not in the way that you might think. Actually, studies show that individuals who observe um, explicit bias can, of course, call it out, particularly if they are white, particularly if they are male um, and, and women as well. I mean, they, they're, they, I wish I could pull my graph up and show you, but there are, um, indicators that show um, across racial lines that white individuals obviously react to the overt expressions of racism. And I think that is what we saw on May 25th, right, mm -hmm. out of Minnesota. The amb more ambiguous, um, covert, implicit bias is now, while it's experienced by individuals who are experienced, you know, while it is experienced by individuals who are being harmed or being offended, uh, and then also not readily acknowledged by those individuals. So it's almost as though you just anticipate it's going to happen and you just kind of fold it into the experience in, in certain contexts. For so, so, so both the giver and the recipient have become so accustomed to what we're a part of that it just like, we're on the hamster wheel and we keep turning. Right. Um, yeah. Or some would even say it might look like someone picking and choosing the battle, right? Like, I'm just not going to combat that. But it's, it's still making impact. It's still harming the individual. And so when, let me try to dial back for a second and think. And, and, and what's, what's amazing about this, this discipline is there are constantly 
intersections, right? It's like multiple concentric circles when I'm talking about bias. I'm talking about yeah. this moment, but I'm also thinking about trauma, which is real too. And, and even though all traumas are not ginormous trauma, a trauma is simply a threat to, or the fear of, you know, uh, uh, um, fear of hurt, harm or, or fatality. So just having that fear, that deep seated fear is a trauma moment, is a trauma agitator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is why we are conscientious in how we talk about who's experiencing the harm and what's happening in that moment. And I don't mean mm -hmm. to confuse you. And oftentimes I tell people I have a jazz brain, so I go all over the <laughs> place. But no, you're good. Together. But, but I, think, I think you're saying a couple of important things that I want to highlight for our listeners and members is one is those experiences that occur for the recipient and implicit bias are traumatic. They are traumas. And it's Absolutely. really, I think it's super important that we recognize them for what they are. Absolutely. They are not just small circumstances that, you know, people let go or don't let go. They are truly traumatic, especially when compounded over a lifetime. Which is um, usually the case. And I don't mean to yeah. jump in. No, go, go, go. Yeah. That, that's one of the reasons why we have a hard time um, humanizing or centering bias in people's lives. Because if you think about trauma for a second, um, you're in, sitting in Austin and I'm sitting here in New York, right? But say for instance, just for the sake of this, 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 pres this rep experiment, a random like wild animal just kind of crashed through the window right now as, in both of our rooms, right? Oh my gosh, here comes a big ah. bird. <laughs> yeah. You know, I know, I think I know my trauma response is to flee. I'm always running whenever something else has happened. And I don't know, yours might be to sit still and, and freeze, fight it, you know, and try probably to a it. runner. I'm probably a runner like you. <laughs> yeah. Runner. <laughs> yeah. And then in any instance, when we, if we have loved ones in our lives and this same thing happens tonight, they get home and they tell us that this wild animal came in and we'll, we'll ask, you know, well, what did you do? If they sat still, and froze, we'd probably respond with what is wrong with you, right? And if they ran and it's, you know, a bear and they're on a, a out jogging and then they take off running, we probably would also say what's wrong with you. Mm -hmm. And then if they fought it, you know, if they said, well, I, I don't know what, if something took over me and I just wrangled this pterodactyl down out of the window, we'd also respond with what's wrong with you. The, what the point I'm trying to make is we oftentimes categorize people's reactions to trauma. And that is what we've been seeing with the protests. People's natural trauma reactions, boom, fight, flee, or freeze, mm -hmm. look very different on very different identities. Mm -hmm. And so I often say if we were all standing in the town square and a loud, you know, boom went off, and we all took off running for our lives. You and I look very different running for our, for our lives. And how we then are engaged by the people who are positioned to serve, protect, help, support us is very different. And is really more so um, navigating, mitigating what we're seeing in the country right now. And that's really why it's important to work with NAR because the in the, the opportunity to acquire residence and home ownership does seem like a universal right and a universal privilege, universal access um, opportunity. But we know that the construct of race in this country has shifted um, that platform and everyone does not have equal access then. And so I'm sorry if I went in and answered a couple of other questions. No, 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 no. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. You know, the, the basis for the partnership is one that is rooted in the history of our industry, which is a history of an American dream that was not readily available to everyone all the time. And so with that, we, you know, we grow through that. There, there's a reason we have a fair housing law and it's because, you know, those rights were not being extended under equitable terms. So it's, um, so let's talk a little bit about fair housing and talk a little bit about how realtors can use what they're going to learn through the curriculum that you guys are helping partner on in their everyday actions as they become more aware of bias that they may hold or, or actions that they've taken even that maybe weren't right and now they feel differently about them. How do they do better moving forward? What should they be doing today? So I'm going to come at this from two of two minds. Um, and I'm going to speak from my perspective first as a, as a trauma specialist. And that is, sure. I oftentimes try to build out some space for compassion. When we learn the new information and realize that the old guard may not have been working and may in fact have harmed people. 
And sometimes when you learn that new information that in that gap, you tend to blame yourself or you'll cower um, or say something like, I'm never going to get it right. So why would I even, you know, even try? So we need some grace as far as uh, the new learning goes and as far as this transformation in this country goes. The transformation in this country, I describe it as new shoes, right? They're beautiful and, and moving in a direction where everyone has access to um, equal rights and protection is a beautiful thing. Um, and one that many of my, you know, like my mom, I don't know that she ever thought she'd ever see that in her lifetime. But it's going to also, like new shoes, be uncomfortable for many. So as we shift into a new era and a new world of how power is distributed and worked with, um, therein lies uh, the, the ways in which the, this, this, uh, this mind science, these workshops and this training will impact um, the lives of real estate agents. Mm -hmm. Because it's not a one size fits all remedy and you can't take one workshop and remove all your biases. So to that, you must first acknowledge your bias. And you don't have to declare it and call up everyone that you've offended in the past and apologize. But moving forward and educating yourself is, you know, working towards some love, some significant accountability. Um, and so, right, establishing yourself as, as a new, a new student, mm -hmm. so to speak. And a lot of us don't think of ourselves as students when, when new information pops up. We just think of ourselves as who we are, learning new information. But we must become students because we have, as a nation, been grossly miseducated and underinformed um, as to why uh, demographics are the way they are, as to why re you know, real estate looks the way it does, um, or schooling looks the way it does. And so we look to the research and the data, and it tells us that children thrive and learn and grow best and are socialized best in diverse environments, both across mm -hmm. racial, gender, sexual um, expression lines and across ability lines, right? And so with this information, realtors <laughs> really should take that as an impetus to informing themselves and looking within their own network and their own lives um, in ways in which they may not have a very diverse, uh, lived experience. Mm -hmm. um, those biases come from a lack of genuine encounters and genuine uh, uh, interpersonal uh, engagement that has very little to do with the characteristics of identity that, that separate you know, separate us. Right. If you haven't had those experiences, it's hard for, or you don't have a diverse sphere of influence, it is difficult to feel like you're engaging in a new way as you're trying to exercise these new muscles, right? Absolutely. And if they're not healthy experiences, right? If you just get right. those messages from television or just get those messages from video games or, or you know, um, or school, you know, certain school curriculums, then they're not genuine. And so um, the mind science workshops, the train the trainer workshops, the ongoing facilitated conversations encourage individuation, debiasing. They encourage a look at the ways in which racial anxiety pop up and create a, a barrier um, to establishing a trusting and lasting relationship. They look at the ways in which stereotype threat um, might rear, you know, show up and impede someone from confidently asserting themselves or, or even advocating for themselves if, if, in any situation. Um, these workshops, again, start the individuals on a journey of how to look at themselves and how to talk about what used to be challenging topics to talk about. It's an interesting concept, um, expanding your sphere of influence for realtors, especially because your, your SOI, your sphere is everything from a business perspective. It is what drives your pipeline. And, you know, in thinking about it traditionally from a business development standpoint, you would purposefully and deliberately enhance or amplify that sphere with people that look like you, feel like you do the things that you do because you have shared experiences and that with, that's, you know, what leads to easy lead generation. And it, it led to a pipeline of business that was good for them. But it also leads to a narrow narrowly um, experienced set of understanding, right? And, and so I think what you're calling on is for realtors to think about sphere of influence in a different way, one that is not just associated with business development, but also re be really deliberate about expanding that sphere in a way that is purposeful so that you are 
rounding out your experiences. Absolutely. And, and also in the process, you will learn too, that it is uh, oftentimes will come, come bring you right back to your, your, the root circle that you were looking at, right? Financial right. or social. Right. Yeah. Oh, listen, realtors will always bring back to business, which is great. That's what's awesome about them. But, but you can, you can work in that sphere in a way that's also growing you on a human level and not just on, on one associated with business. Um, and I think that, I think that's powerful when, when, partnered in parallel with the kind of curriculum that you're talking about and that self-awareness and you know doing a little bit of work with yourself at the same time that you're expanding these experiences can be a great thing listen in the midst of this global pandemic uh we're talking about building uh human connection and yeah and awareness in a whole new way <laughs> yeah okay, yeah right? and still yeah. struggling with that because yeah. again, the, the, the grace that we require in learning new information oftentimes is not there. What also exacerbates bias um, and discrimination and, and, and uh, biased attitudes and behavior is time pressure. And so oftentimes we don't slow down enough to ask in t you know, intentional questions or realize that someone isn't just the sum of the, the group that we you know, lump them all into, um, that they may in fact have more in common with us than we than we thought, than we perceived. You know, uh, stepping into that interaction, and so that is is crucial to keep in mind. It's it's salient to the work we do across many disciplines. We work with healthcare; um, they are under tremendous pressure, uh, mm -hmm. time pressure with large caseloads, and we look at the outcomes of that time pressure being significant racial racialized healthcare disparities in the wake of COVID. We see that with the, you know, infant mortality rates and, uh, chronic, you know, heart disease rates and so on and so forth. So many other indicators. Um, and so really the first, the, the first, uh, you know, gym is slow down, individuate and get to know one another on a, on a real level. Yeah. If your interactions can be deep, a level deeper than the veneer of a person, then you'll probably you know, enhance that experience more powerfully, but also actually know the person. Absolutely. And knowing them is different than interacting with them quickly. I often say, or we often say, there's a difference between nice and kind. And if they were the same, yeah. the same word, but a lot of people say, well, what is the difference? And I said, well, nice. Ooh, in the South, that's very clear. <laughs> I could bless everybody's heart, but that's not the same as really caring for them. Yeah, oh, I, yeah. I have to clarify for the South. <laughs> no, no, we've got you. <laughs> but I know what you mean. I mean, it, you know, huh. I, I can be pleasant and that's very different than being deliberately kind. Totally. That, that takes action and effort. Totally. We do it all the time. What we used to when we were flying, right? Remember going through TSA and if yeah. you gave your documents over and they handed them back and they'd say, well, thank you. Have a nice flight. And you say, oh, great. Thanks. You too. And they're not going anywhere. Right. If you were right. Kind, right. Like if you really kind of cared, right. You walk up and you're like, how's your day today? I'm sure you've had a lot of people. I'm sure you, this is the hundredth time you're answering that question. Yeah. So if time they hand you your documents and say, have a nice flight. You say, maybe I'll see you on my return or you too, I hope you get a break at some point. And so mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the, the, a snapshot difference between, between the two and how to uh, not fill in the answers um, with what you think um, or, or have your brain kind of fill in those answers quickly so that you can be on your way. It's really pausing in that moment to establish a, a genuine relationship. Yeah. So as I'm thinking about diversifying your sphere, uh, creating more meaningful relationships through your experiences, one of the things that is apparent in our industry from an association leadership perspective in terms of the leadership running many of the large franchises and brokerage firms is that there's a lack of diversity at those top tiers. That's not unusual or specific to real estate, but it should be a part of the conversation if we're embarking on this partnership. How do we, from an organizational level, create space for that change and to well, improve that? Well, another uh, attribute of uh, or attribute of the interventions that we offer is also replacing stereotypes and seeing new, seeing people in positions of, of power and authority that have not traditionally been, been, been placed in those roles. And that's one of the reasons that we struggle with seeing women at the top um, across so many different sectors, knowing farewell, right, that they are just as, and even sometimes more qualified. 
but um, shifting the gender binary, right? Like looking at the ways in which uh, those power dynamics play and, and racial dynamics play um, really kind of harken back to, to access to power and how, again, who we see and deem as powerful. This work requires us to see people in new light. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this time in America, this transformation that we're going through is going to shift all of our focus and reframe a lot of how we tell stories about one another, how people are uh, captured on television and in radio and in narrative, and also who then deserves access, right? Like who deserves a home? Who deserves to own? Who deserves to sit at the helm of a board? Who deserves to sit in the big corner office? Um, it, it, and it will not be just about who deserves it, but who deserves to be in that position, right? Like who do we need to see so that our children see better models? Again, go yeah. back to the children and think about that diversity, the impact of diversity. They also need to see diverse leadership. They also mm -hmm. need to see diverse authority because they will become better players uh, throughout their growth and development as well. You know, I have always thought that and understood the, the concept that if you see it, you could be it, but that hits home differently in the, in the context of my own experience. And I'll just say it this way. My children have never seen the way that I work. They, I intentionally separated that from my home life. I went to an office and I did the things and I traveled and then I came home and I was mom and just mom. But I know that in watching them and hearing them talk about what they see demonstrated every day with, with us being homebound, they have this different understanding of what has been modeled for them and what it looks like to work. Because now it looks like talking on video calls all day. And mom, are you recording something? And mom, who are you talking to? And you know, there it's, I, I really kind of, I think we've all had this change in our understanding of what they can perceive and how that will change their thinking for a long, long time. Absolutely. And how we see and perceive ourselves, right? How yeah, we see, yeah. Um, the value in someone like yourself moving up the ranks, um, the value in mentoring you, the value in supporting you, the value in returning a phone call or returning an email, right? That we know implicit bias is imp bias, uh, implicit or not, right, is impacting how people respond to people, how people read uh, correspondence and email, and that that all has impact in how people are able to access, again, power control in their own lives and in their professional lives. And so yeah. for, your, for, for, for the boys, right, to see mm -hmm. mom in a position of power, you're socializing them not only to see you in a position of power, but also to, um, I'm going to shift for a second, almost to see you platonically even, right? And that, mm. that is a gift for so many young developing children to develop uh, perceptions of boys and girls across lines of gender platonically, mm -hmm. right? That mm -hmm. then shifts the, the emphasis on sexualized experiences at, at young ages before children are even ready for that. Um, and it helps them be, keep maintain friendships. It helps them, you know, become yeah. better essentially be better people if they can right. really have friends with be, all because they saw you working in your full capacity at home. <laughs> well, well, God willing, this, this experience won't completely ruin them. It will, it will result in growth that will be powerful for them These eventually. Be, these 2020 kids are going to be strong. Oh, they're going to be special. <laughs> let me, um, let me, let me leave us here before we run through a lightning round. I want to know just based on your experiences, your expertise, who you are, do you have hope? for what our future looks like with this conversation? Wow. wow, that almost sent chills to my body. I've not been asked that question and I really appreciate it. I do, I do have hope. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm someone who myself does not have children and always am infatuated by the youth. I find them incredibly hopeful and aspiring um, and inspiring as well. And so yes, that's where my hope lies that um, you, the youth are savvy <laughs> yeah. they're 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 almost too savvy but they're that's, quick that's, yeah they're, they're quick they're fast. Yeah. um i i oftentimes when i'm talking about the youth I, I mentioned that i learned about the civil rights movement when i was about six or seven years old my mom mm. had like video footage and because that was her childhood experience and a lot of people would often say aren't kids too young to see that information or to see what's happening on on the news but you know, it was the youth that carried the civil rights movement at some point because their parents had to work. 
And mm -hmm. so they said, well, we'll just go down and we'll sit at lunch counters and we'll get on those buses or, and won't get off. Um, Claudette Colvin was 13 years old when, uh, you know, months before Rosa Parks, you know, enacted her, her, her stance. And so, yes, my hope lies in the youth and, um, and, and also in us listening to them. I would love to mm -hmm. see us really turn um, to them for, 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 for some kind of guidance. You'd be surprised how much they've been paying attention, as you say, your boys have been. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's awesome. That that's a high note to end on. Let's let's talk about some fun, not hard stuff. Just yeah. to wrap it up with some with a fun round. That's what cool. is your favorite guilty pleasure TV series that you've been watching while you've been stuck at home? Ooh, I don't know that I can say those. On TV. Uh oh, <laughs> none. <laughs> only because it's really, uh, you know, people would say really trashy, but it's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll go with the lighter. I lots and uh, copious amounts of say yes to the dress. Oh yes, yeah, the that's dresses. that's healthy. Yes, <laughs> fashion and you know, you yeah, know. yeah. But do you get mad when she picks the wrong one? Because that's where I'm like, that's not okay. Yeah, I'm almost personally <laughs> offended by ugly wedding dresses. Yeah, yeah. Well, especially when she had else. that other beautiful option. Right, right. And if um, male, yeah, no, I'm not happy. <laughs> <laughs> what is your so you went on a quick little trip what's your favorite road trip song in the car oh wow only because I heard this yesterday I really like singing it's raining men by the oh uh, yes that's a good yeah. one <laughs> yeah I don't even they, at one point they were two tons of fun and then they were oh I'm Martha Wash <laughs> Maybe Marvel an appropriate follow-up to say yes to the dress is it's raining men, so that there's a theme funny, there. Because I'm so not, you know, I also, but, um, <laughs> That's all right. Yeah, anything, I love disco, actually. I, I used to sing in a disco band, so yes. I. Fun, fun. <laughs> um, who is your favorite author right now? You know, we work um, with the uh, Mind Science out of the Belonging Institute in Stanford University. Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt's book, Biased, is yeah. absolutely one of my favorite. Um, I reference it all the time. And I, I actually enjoy her in interviews as well, um, just talking yeah. about this work. Um, and so yeah, Jennifer, Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt, she is right. golden at writing about bias. Awesome. We'll link up to it. That's great. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time and for your oh, energy and commitment it. to this partnership. We're so, so appreciative to have you. Thank you. Likewise. You all have a wonderful, wonderful day, wonderful week. You bet. Thank you.